I'd like to thank each of you for sharing some time with me this morning to permit me to give you just a very brief overview of ASBOG and our involvement with professional ethics. I suspect that in the audience, there are a number of people who have really no idea what ASBOG is. Is it some wet marshy area that you stumble through? No, that's not it. First of all, we can't spell because the organization is officially the National Association of State Boards of Geology, but that sounds even worse than ASBOG. So we left it with the ASBOG um, name. So what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a background and set the arena in which we're going to be talking about professional ethics. So for those of you that are intimately familiar with the organization, please bear with me. ASBOG came about as a result of a need. In the late 1980s, it was becoming clear that more and more states were requiring the licensure of geologists, those individuals who wanted to practice geology for the public. It had grown from their first state being Arizona and California came on board in 1968. More and more states were requiring licensure. And this was putting a burden on two groups. One, the states, which were developing licensing, and on the potential licensees. The states were facing costs associated with developing licensing procedures. Most states, if not all, required a written examination. That had to be prepared. And so we had multiple states now doing the same thing not always in an identical fashion. And so aside from the cost associated to the states, the potential licensee was now facing a problem. Most geologists that carry licenses are licensed in a variety of states because their work takes place across rather broad geographic areas, not limited exclusively to the political boundaries of a state. Therefore, if you wanted to be licensed in multiple states, you were having to jump through a variety of hoops, slightly different requirements, having to take different written examinations. This was time consuming and costly. So recognizing this, a number of states in the southeastern quadrant of the United States got together with the thought, why can't we create an overarching organization that can bring and promote similarity in requirements, and perhaps more importantly, develop a common examination that can be used by all states. In other words, a potential licensee could take the exam and it would be accepted in those states that he or she wished to be licensed, not requiring that person then to take multiple exams. So as you can see, the states that participated in the initial formation of the organization are listed there. I won't read them to you. But so in 1990, ASBOG was formally organized and we offered our first written examinations in 1992. Since 1992, ASBOG has grown 30 states in the United States currently require the licensure of individuals if you wish to practice for the general public. Puerto Rico also uh, is a licensed entity, a licensing entity. About 40,000 licenses are given. Now there may be redundancy because people like me carry licenses from a variety of states, but that's the number of people that we're talking about in this pool more or less. And we're currently exploring and working on trying to establish cooperative testing and licensing agreement with our colleagues in Canada in the various provinces there. This is just a schematic, a kind of a cartoon to show you that you can literally now walk from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from Canada to Mexico and stay in ASBOG country. The green ones obviously are ASBOG. The gray states are those which currently do not have licensing for geologists. It's anticipated that within the foreseeable future, a number of these states uh, will consider uh, and move toward licensing. 
In a number of states, it's already been before various governmental committees and houses of uh, legislature and things of this sort. Uh, sometimes meeting difficulty and sometimes being only partially successful. So I'm anticipating that before long we will see more green states. Fundamentally, this is the hallmark of any licensing organization, those words in red. You establish licensing not to give me a fancy laminated card I can carry in my billfold, but ostensibly it's designed to aid in the protection of public health, welfare, and safety. So that's the overarching reason we have licensures, whether it's your doctor, your lawyer, or what have you, or the geoscientists in our case. Everybody's kind of interested in what volume we're dealing with. Here's some data for the last decade or so involving the number of candidates that we test. Now, there are two tests that we offer. One is a fundamentals exam, which can be taken with slight variations depending on state requirements immediately upon graduation with an undergraduate degree in geoscience. Uh, that is the fundamentals, which is shown in the blue line on this particular graphic. The red line represents our second exam, which is the practice exam which you can take once you've accrued the amount of experience required in a particular state. That varies from state to state, but basically we're looking from three to five years of supervised experience. So when you add these numbers together, we give the exam twice a year. It approximates about 1,800 individuals per year are involved in the examination process. Now, of course, the next question that everybody wants to know, how do people do on the exam? What we're looking at are four colored lines. The blue lines represents the performance on the fundamentals exam. The red lines represent the performance on the practice exam. You'll ask me why there are four lines. I'll tell you in just a moment. But one thing you'll notice about this with almost no exception, the performance on the fundamentals exam falls below the performance on the practice exam. Remember, the fundamentals exam is the one that you should or can, in most cases, take immediately upon graduation. It's In many ways, it's equivalent to what most of us understand the old EIT exam to be. We call this the GIT. We're not very original, but it gets the message across. If you take a look at this and sort of average those two blue lines together, something on the order of about 65% of the candidates taking that exam are successful. That means 35% aren't successful. Now, answering the question, why are there two lines representing the performance on the fundamentals exam? The upper line, whether it's blue or red, represents the performance of first-time test takers. The lower line, whether red or blue, represents the performance of those who come back for a second, third, or fourth time. Guess what that does to the average, generally speaking, it drags it down. It has, when I was running the California licensing program, we had a record 16 times and still batting zero. That was the record. The performance on the red line or the practice exam, basically about 70, 75% more or less successful. So again, it's a pattern that's existed over time. Okay, if you take a look at ASBOG's statement of purpose, you'll find two elements in it. The first one basically talks about trying to improve professional competency, and the second one deals with professional ethics. So I'm going to shift a little bit from describing ASBOG to looking at what we do with regard to professional ethics. ASBOG got aggressively involved in professional ethics as a result of two events, driven by what we call a task analysis. 
Now allow me to bore some of you, but perhaps to educate some others. What is a task analysis? Well, if you're in the business of putting together a licensing exam at the national level, it's appropriate that that exam test what the profession is doing at that time. Now, one of the things we recognize as geoscientists is that geology is not static. It changes. Think about the courses that you took, in my case, in the early Triassic back in graduate school, and think about what the subject matter in those same areas is today. Is it the same? When I was there, we were still thinking that continental drift was some really weird idea. But this is the sort of thing we're dealing with. So that's one of the reasons that you'll see that task analysis are repeated about every five years to catch up and make sure the questions do in fact address what is currently being done. So to develop the blueprints for our exams, we surveyed the population of practicing geologists in 2005 and 2010 in the United States, Canada. And in 2010, we broke out the academic community as a separate category to see if their responses as to what they do in terms of importance and time spent vary. We asked them to evaluate some 43 geological tasks ranging from rock identification to structural geology to hydrogeological issues, and to rank those by importance. We also, in both of those questionnaires which were sent out, we asked them to respond to 13 professional ethical issues in terms of importance in 2005, and we became a little bit more sophisticated by asking them to address frequency and seriousness in 2010. Let's see what, we, these were some of the questions or the ethical issues we asked them to concern themselves with. You could add and subtract, not interested in arguing about whether you're on this particular list or not on this particular list, a particular topic. But things that we've already heard mentioned today, conflict of interest, plagiarism, retaliation against whistleblowers. These are things that I'm probably safe in saying that every person in this room to some extent has encountered in their professional career. So these were the 13 issues that people were asked to address in their surveys in 2005 and 2010. In 2005, uh, excuse me, we had a very qualitative sort of response. How important did you view it? Well, the thing that sort of grabbed us was the fact that in the responses coming back from the practicing licensed professionals in those groups that I mentioned, they rank professional ethical issues as higher in importance than any of the single geologic technical areas that you might think of. With that in mind, we moved into the 2010 analysis in which we asked people to comment again on the same 13 issues which are shown along the bottom of the graph. I'm not interested in the detail. I want you to just see the shape of things. In terms of the frequency, which is shown in blue, and the seriousness of that particular issue, which is shown in red. What you can appreciate is that there is variability in both frequency of the issue being encountered and their perception, the practitioner's perception of the seriousness. Again, things like gift giving, not regarded as particular serious, but you know, kind of not frequently encountered. Plagiarism, misrepresentation of professional qualifications. 